Welcome to the Abyssinian syllabary, where we spell out Ethiopia in 33 characters. I'm Yves Marie Stranger, your host and the compiler of these Abyssinian lives. Nota bene. While any resemblance to actual countries, past or present, and to historical figures is not purely coincidental, this is a work of fiction. For a primer on these Ethiopian characters, newcomers may start with the prologue by Manuel de Goes. To order the book or a poster of the Abyssinian syllabary, visit Ethiopia.com. That's U T H I O P I A dot com. To do nothing at all, such is the ideal, Zara Jacob said to Berda as they weeded their cabbage patch. Yes, yes, he continued while slicing with his hoe. Verily, I practice this nothingness each day and with ingeminated vigor each time. The Apocrypha of Zara Jacob. Evon de Yvonne belted out his first yowl in a coracle among the eddies of the Euphrates. His father had no idea of how to steer this walnut husk of a boat, for they were Kashkar Armenians from a land of mountain peaks, of Edelweiss and piebald cows. Our cows are emblazoned on their flanks with the same colours as the walls of stone of our church of St. Saviour's, his father liked to remark with affection both for the cows and for the church, as if this chromatic concordance were a natural marvel, an uncle would later tell Yvonne when they met up decades later in Los Angeles at a diaspora luncheon. The Turks had once been Ottoman, much as their Armenian brethren. They had junked this millennial guise very promptly for a new ethnic nationalism. They reached the Kashgar that autumn with Kurd tribesmen mounted on Anatolian ponies. These Turks and Kurds told the Armenians that they were to leave, forsaking their piebald cows with their full udders, as otherwise the Greeks and Russians and other Christian nations would divide the lands of their new Turkish republic that was indivisible and, if not Muslim, certainly not Christian first. The parents had kissed their cows goodbye and taken their leave from the brown walls of their church. Armenian villages burnt on the horizon and they thought themselves lucky to be alive. It is during their long exodus that Evon emerged onto the waters in their round bark that swirled like a top in the river under his father's maladroit rowing. It is the first and last time that I give birth to a child while dizzy his mother had exclaimed between two contracting waves. And right she was, since the ineffectual mariner proceeded to die of dysentery in Deir el-Zor and was followed by herself not a year later of the same disease in a shack of flattened out petrol barrels abutting the walls of holy Jerusalem. Yvonne ran wild in the streets of the Armenian neighborhood, an exciting place for a child. Jerusalem was, at the time, crammed with refugees of their kind. There were Syriacs, Circassians, Orthodox and Catholic Greeks, and Palestinians of all confessions, and even a few Jews. He spoke all tongues badly and played truant from school, but was at heart a good boy. Evon had been scooped up from the street by an orphanage built by Chicago Armenians, who had made their fortunes in corned beef, and one ate well in this orphanage, stuffed artichokes, a leg of lamb with apricots on Sundays and black olives every weekday, spread on sesame bread. The boys were dressed in linen shirts, pressed till rigid as planks, and as the boys' jet black hair was plastered to their skull, their heads themselves resembled black olive paste spread on a hunk of pasty bread. The hyphenated Americans were pleased to be charitable as long as the charity were purposeful. The boys were taught music, a pursuit in which Evon proved very gifted. He chose the trumpet. They played on instruments from a discarded lot of the Michigan Philharmonic Orchestra, which, 
their philanthropists, in their mixture of generosity and miserliness, had expedited to Jerusalem in boxes of white pine wood in which any open space between the instruments had been stuffed with tins of king's corned beef. Second choice, it unabashedly advertised under the image of the crowned monarch. No matter, and what joy! The orphans feasted on corned beef for three weeks, breakfast, lunch and dinner, all the while blowing into their trombones and trumpets till their lungs ached and laying waste to the string instruments that they played with their teeth. A master of music, an Armenian from the conservatory of Constantinopolis, was sent for to put a semblance of harmony in this cacophony and the orphanage Sunday afternoon concerts became a cornerstone of the social life of the Armenian community of Jerusalem. And this is how, when the king of a Negro country arrived on a pilgrimage to Holy Jerusalem in 1924, a concert was staged in the honour of this savage monarch. The Negro king was of stately bearing, for even though he was very short, he possessed a sharp nose and a glossy black goatee, and this king, as behooves such men, simply got to his feet at the end of the concert, declaring, Frabjus, I'll take four dozen, carry away, for my country could do with a brass band. Evon was to reminisce many a time in the intervening decades upon the pretty postcard he carried about in his head of the steamboat sailing out from Haifa, and of the oranges that the eagle-nosed emperor handed them with his own hand after the concert they gave on the bridge at twilight. The sun, like the oranges, was blood-red that first night. The voyage itself was a series of snapshots of sunsets forever setting on new ports of call. Alexandria, where they played to the Greek community, Port Sudan, where it was so hot their fingers stuck to the instruments, Djibouti, and the concertino they gave at the French governor's residence. Mais vraiment, forty orphans, quand même, the governor's wife had exclaimed, dabbing at her eyes. Then there was the Rhinoceros Express and its imperial Wagon Restaurant, in which the French cook concocted for the forty orphans mousse au chocolat à la goutte jamit, although he was called Monsieur Rouget. The Gatsos only answered to the name Monsieur Ducasse, because such had been the name of the king's first French cuisinier. They pulled into the monarch's capital at dawn, with much use of the steam whistle. This city, much like the railway itself, seemed a shiny toy, a model town blanketed in a pervasive mix of cow dung smoke and eucalyptus vapours. Oh, what fun! Open cars awaited them in front of the station, their engines idling, and the forty orphans were whisked off to the palace, where they were at first housed in the attics, before being pensioned off with the Armenian families of Addis Ababa. For in those days, the Armenians, together with the Greeks, were the empire's craftspeople, distillers and photographers, tailors and shoemakers, jewellers and stonemasons. They were all poor foreigners. Before long, in earshot of the new apostolic Armenian Orthodox Church of the Ethiopias, an Armenian language school was opened by a few masters who had returned with certificates from Marseille. This learning institute was found just above the Ras Mekonen Bridge, plumb in the middle of Saratenya Sefer, the neighbourhood of the workers. In those years, the forty orphans played at all the feasts, all the celebrations. The Greeks, the Armenians, the French, and all the other Ferenc communities had an affectionate epithet for the toy town the emperor had built, Eucalyptopolis. Evon, for his part, who was a devotee of Jean de Brunhoff, called it Babarville, with an impish grin. He remained a prankish boy with a good heart. Much later, much, much later, a war, together with a famine or two, and a revolution having torn to shreds the model town, Evon and his friends, when they met in Los Angeles, Vancouver or Boston, were to call those sepia-coloured times, l'époque corne de bif. It meant nothing at all. It meant the world to them.